It's the three schlubs and the pretty one. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> schlubs and the pretty one. My, uh, my beater or whatever they call it on. <laughs> Alright, well, it's not letting me uh, put a file in there. So. Oh, it's okay. By the way, we've been broadcasting for the last, like, five seconds. So. Oh, oh, have we so really? Whatever. Yeah. We're live? Yep, we're live right now. Awesome. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to the, the WGC scene. Community Live Show. We're coming right at you. Thank you for joining us for another week of awesomeness, I guess. Uh, this is Jum. Uh, uh, Jum. Uh, I just woke up, so my um, I can't talk. Um, this is Jum from WGC, and we got Tan over there uh, hey, hey. joining us as my co-host, as always. We have James as our producer, going, uh, guys? host and uh, guest host, and uh, Miss our community guest host. Hello. So I want you. I want to just go around really. Quick. I don't know why I introduced guy and then make you guys introduce yourselves, which is the same thing I just said. So, <laughs> yeah, so go for it, Ted. Okay, right. I'm Mini Girl, and um, I apologize in advance, guys. I I have a kind of a sore throat. I'm getting a cold, so I'm sorry if I sound raspy. Just pretend I'm going with the sultry Kathleen Turner sound today. Um, should I go right into my topic? Oh uh, no, we got well. We have to have James introduce him to stuff okay. and stuff like that. Yeah, she got all gussy. She she gets all gussy up for a live show. It's pretty good. <laughs> she's going I to get so did it. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Like, oh wait, hold on a second, guys. That's why we're late. We're like sixty minutes oh, late. Right. <laughs> oh right. Like, hey, guys, I gotta go get ready and stuff. Oh right. <laughs> All right, uh, James? Yeah, uh, my name is Jim, James, whatever you want to call me. Uh, Gift the Chaos Studio is my channel name. Um, you know, I just do whatever on my channel so far. Yeah, and the last, the other five minutes were late because he had to go get guests. He was like, oh, if Mini Girl's going to do it, then come <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then we got Mist. Uh, Jed, a.k.a. Mystics from uh, the Mystics YouTube channel. Yeah, and uh, you also run the live show, right? Yeah, um, sunshine and moonbeam with uh, Mars. Yeah, you, did. Did you guys do one uh, yesterday? Because I yeah. was like asleep, so I didn't catch that. Yeah, we did uh, episode three. Talked about basing with uh, David Peace. Oh, that's why I was so asleep. I'm like, oh, it's just David Peace. I'm not even bother watching. That. <laughs> <laughs> that's why? Um, anyways, guys, I want you to show you something. This is what happens when a uh, Riptide goes up goes up against a Wraith Knight. See, this is what happens. Oh. No feet left. That's all that's left. <laughs> I like so the anyways. snow. I like the snow. <laughs> the snow is cool. Yes, yeah. that was the only thing that's left. So uh, we have some cool topics. So why don't we jump right into that? What was our main topic that Ken? Main topic is basically fantasy versus 40k. Um, when I first got into tabletop gaming, I was only introduced to 40k aspect of it and didn't really know much about fantasy. I, in fact, I didn't even know that there were two games until I started getting into it a little bit more and learning, oh, fantasy is this other game. How come I don't know much about it? Why is it not as popular? But yet it seems like it's an older game. Like it seems like the, I don't want to say the older folks, but like um, it's almost like taboo if you're a teenager getting into fantasy. It's, it's really weird. And yeah, well, I don't know if there's a difference. If, if you're, you know, you're saying why, why the other one isn't popular. I think it is. It's just, um, anyways, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, but no, no, I, I kind of want your guys' thoughts on it. Well, you know, um, fantasy actually is popular. It's just I don't. I think the fantasy crowd is less outspoken than the 40k crowd. Okay, that's what I was kind of wanting to get from you guys. Like, why does it seem like 40? Why does it seem like 40k is more popular, and especially with the younger crowd? I think that's why it is young crowd. I don't know. I mean, I know uh, James here now. Miss he doesn't play either, so he could you know he could field questions about like you know, from a noob standpoint. But I know James plays yeah. both. What are your thoughts about why forty k seems to be the loudest crowd? Yeah. Well, uh, my roots actually started in fantasy uh, about twenty three years ago. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, I've been doing this a long time. And fantasy was, um, in my area, a very popular game. And I, I was really young, seeing uh, the artillery of the Empire up on a hill, seeing how it worked and being really into history was, for me, a really big thing. Mm -hmm. 
40 K didn't really have a lot of fluff back then. So I actually despised 40 K. The models looked really stupid, um, in my eyes. Um, but I think now that if we look at it now, at, um, there's been such a huge development with the storyline. The models have come um, and progressed in such leaps and bounds that I think mm -hmm. there's something for everybody to look at and there's an attraction for everybody. You have mm -hmm. kind of the people that might be, I guess you could say like the emos that might like, uh, <laughs> for, <laughs> for lack of better terms, that might like, the chaos. Now, I'm not an emo, but I love chaos. So <laughs> I thought the, the quote-unquote emo people play the Dark Eldars. Well, yeah, I mean, you might have them too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but there's just, and then you got the the purists like uh, Coach, let's say, who's just so into um, the Ultramarines and the Grey Knights. That's just, you know, like the the rules and the the boom, boom, boom purists. You know, like everything's so great. Um, I believe we I call them fanboys. Yeah, fanboys. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> yeah. so in my opinion, there's just the the fluff, the models, everything has progressed in in the last few years. That um, there's just something for everybody, and it appeals to everybody uh, more so than when I first started out. Um, uh, going to the chat real quick. It says, uh, GT Technics said, I, for one, have trouble affording a 40K horde army, let alone a fantasy army. It's a ton of models to buy and paint. So, I, you know, I, I can understand that. It, it does get pricey. I can under and, I, and from what I understand, is it true you have to have more armies in fantasy? Is that more right? Figures. Well, more figures. Well, that's one of the things that GT Technics uh, did hit on is that... Uh, Fantasy does include a lot more figures that you have to build up, not only build up, but buy, I guess. Buy, paint, yeah, it's a yeah, lot more work. And paint and stuff like that. Cause you're, you're, right. It really is, I think, uh, fantasy is a 40, it's all about horde armies because you got units and everything. Like, it's just nature of the fantasy. Right. So, like, yeah. if you're going to play a, you know, a game of, let's say, uh, a thousand points, it's a lot more figures and models than it is a thousand points of 40K. Yeah. You know? Okay. Yeah, because a forty k mostly unit is like if you're playing space marines, like a unit of ten, whereas yeah. you're playing fantasy, where it could be up to a unit of fifty. Oh my gosh! Wow. So it depends on how and, you want to run, you know. Right, and I was thinking of getting into fantasy too, because the I was looking at the characters once I started realizing that fantasy existed, how much there is, and they're just so cool looking. But there, you have to have so many, I guess. That's a lot. That's well, this is something that I'm going to touch into when I when I get into my topic. But I think there's a lot of things that um, there are other armies that you know the K warriors of chaos with fantasy are. You can have a three thousand point army and have six units on the board. <laughs> so yeah. you not everybody wants to play a warriors of chaos army though. For the empire, you have to have hundreds of dollars invested in it because they're such a weak uh, they have such weak units and you have to know how to work them and it takes a lot of strategy whereas a space marine um, you put them in in a field or in a, in the woods and they get the cover save they get all this crazy stuff and you don't really have to worry about them dying as easily as a guy that has uh, like a five plus armor save that gets killed by a a, a a pistol, right? So, you know, you do you do need a lot more models, and it's a lot more investment in fantasy. Absolutely, time wise too, because painting them is a pain in the butt. Um, yeah, it's like the, painting the fantasy. Work. Yeah, because they have so much uh, details to it in the way of oh look, I got paint the knife because everyone has a little knife. Mm -hmm. uh, and then now yeah. I got paint, you know, the feathers because everyone, especially like high elves and widows, are all feathery. Well, no, widows are very feathery, I think, right? High See, I think that very... looks cool, though. I think that mm -hmm. would be so fun to paint. It does. Oh yeah, you say that now. Let, let, I'll. You can paint my game in art, and then you can come back and tell me how fun it is. <laughs> One thing I... that. I... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. no, no go, go ahead, ahead Jed. No, we want to hear your. We want to hear your yeah. thoughts. Uh, now, from this, I'm not really into either of them. I have my little Necron army, but that's about it. But 
from what I can see of both fantasy and 40k is it almost speaks to the sign of the times is where a lot of the older people remember the old fantasy books, the fantasy movies that that came out in like the early 80s and mid 80s. Mm -hmm. Would like you went to the early 2000s and the late 90s, sci-fi had a huge boom. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of yeah. like, I think that kind of fed off the popular culture of there's something in in 40k that fed to all kinds of the sci-fi genres. Yeah. Where yeah. the fantasy genre was more of the 80s. I mean, that's yes. coming from my point of view of it all. George okay. on the ch George on the chat says that he's been a sci-fi fantasy guy, or excuse me, a sci-fi guy since I was about five or so. Forty years later, I still lean towards sci-fi than more so than fantasy. So it's I think it just comes down to preference. Yeah, it is, and I think there is a lot more sci-fi people out there than the yeah, fantasy. yeah. Like like Jed said, it's the sign of the times, you know. Well, or maybe yeah. a little more modern. But you guys, yeah, because back then, fantasy is kind of almost tabooish, I think, because sci-fi is more mainstream back then. You know, we got Star Wars and Star Trek, right. yeah, you yeah, know, right. and, and everything like right. that. Nowadays, yeah. uh, a lot of fantasy is coming up because, you know, Game of Thrones became such a huge hit. All the, you know, producers were like, oh, my gosh, let's just do every single fantasy book out there now and make it into a show because, yeah. you know, Game of Thrones is so good. I mean, Game of Thrones is good because they have a lot of nudity and... Violence and everything that everything, yeah. everyone likes. Yeah. So I, I um, let me ask something. Go for it. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. Um, go for it. I was just gonna say when I when I first started on YouTube and and reading comments about fantasy, reading comments about 40k, I remember one person had likened fantasy to like the Grey Poupon of gaming and 40k is like just yellow deli mustard you know and that kind of always that, kind of, I, that was the first terminology that I or comparison that I had ever heard and I was like huh I wonder does 40k have that stigma of being sort of like you know the young punk kids play that and it's it's for the it's for the loser people or for the people that are not really into the true game of the game I mean what do you guys think do you think 40K has a bad stigma. Oh, there's definitely a stigma in the hobby between the yeah. two. I, I, James will maybe confirm with us that after, you know, I like, get my little comparison because I do it all the time and I like I, I mainly do it because I know there's a lot of 40K people out there and they like to shout louder mm -hmm. than the fantasy yeah. people, so I always stick with them and say, you know, mm -hmm. oh yeah, hey, I, I, I like to play with Legos too, <laughs> you know, and stuff like that, you know, versus you know, I, I, I'd rather play chess versus your checking type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I like doing right, it just right. to mess with people. Yeah. Both <laughs> games are very different. Yes. Even though they, yes. even though Sixth Edition stole a lot of the mechanics uh, from fantasy, um, but it's different in the way that fantasy is very, very technically strategic. Because it's all about you know moving. It's like playing like you're Napoleon trying to take over the world, and mm -hmm. you're playing you know your little war games on the table. That's yeah. kind of how I like fantasy is because you got to figure out. All your units more of the old fashioned, more of the old fashioned type weapons. Old fashioned type of thing, yeah. Mm. Versus where, oh yes. look, I okay. can play Atari now, and then you know, dee, 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 press the red button, you know, the joystick, and then there you got yeah. you know, 40k. Yeah. I'm going to get a lot of slack from saying that, but I always, like I said, I like doing that. Um, I think, James, anyways, your, your yeah. thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, 40k has become a very almost a, a mindless game now where if you look at the Tau, you can sit there and you can you can destroy a unit of space marines without even having to see them. Um, mm -hmm. You can... You don't even have to really... It's it's just a point-and-click kind of game now, uh, almost to the, akin to um, a video game. Um, but in my hobby shop, uh, where we go grasshoppers, um, there were people actually playing fantasy and our store is a very 40k kind of store, mm -hmm. and we we had three people come and play fantasy that actually don't play in the store at all that we've never seen, um, and we kind of laughed at them. We didn't laugh in their faces because we didn't want to be rude, but <laughs> um, <laughs> but my first words were fantasy. What the heck, you know? Now. I have a fantasy army. I have, um, but I haven't played 8th edition. Uh, nobody plays fantasy 
in my circle of friends. Yeah, um, I think they're fr yeah, I think they're afraid to invest the money in it. I want to play fantasy again because it's not a mindless point and click kind of game. You right. do have to plot out the strategy. You do have to um, know how to wheel your units to be able to take a jar a charge or um, be able to charge. Uh, um, 40k is relaxing in a way. Um, fantasy is a brain game. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you see the older people kind of going and gravitating towards fantasy and the younger people going towards 40k. 40k is easy for beginners, I think, to initially get into and to, to kind of grasp what it's yeah. about. At least it was for me. Yeah. I mean, I'm still learning 40k. I'll probably always still be learning 40k. Right. But I, I think they're they're trying to get broaden their net, their mm -hmm. their audience to get people in to you know draw them in, and it's harder. I think fantasy is a harder draw because it, it is more it complicated. Is. First of all, it is yeah, it is fantasy, so a lot of people are like oh it looks cool and all, but look at all the figures you have to do. It's kind of intimidating when you look at yeah. two different tables. If you look at a say two thousand point game. Um, 40k 2000 point game versus a 2000 point game where someone's using, say, Skavens and then, yeah, uh, even like Ogres. I mean, even Ogres is like the smallest unit, I think, of, the, of their factions in fantasy, and that's still a lot of figures, yeah. You know, so you, you look at it and you're like, oh, well, I'll just play 40k one with sci fi, everyone can relate to Space Marines, right? Um, and um, I don't know why everyone can relate to Space Marines, but. So you look oh, at they're it, you're cool. like, <laughs> they look like robots. Everyone loves robots. <laughs> well, you know, space cool. marines. You know, they're like, oh wow, I've never heard of this before. Thank God, GW came up with space marines. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I but, think uh, that. Go ahead, I think the like reason why a lot of people can associate with space marines is we grew up with stormtroopers, with colonial right. soldiers from starship troopers. We we understand the. Hordes of soldiers going out to do whatever they whatever they're told to do by their space boss, so to speak. Yeah. Where, yeah. whereas in fantasy, we are like some of us read the books. We understand like Dungeons and Dragons, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of where the Great Poupon and the, the Yellow Deli Muster came in. Is to them, it's like we play the more superior product. This is why. On the other hand, the forty Ks. Well, we play this. It's it's like any other game system out there. Mm -hmm. Xbox, PlayStation, Pepsi, Coke, whatever. You're it's always going to have opposing forces, and they're always going to clash with each other, no matter what. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But, but um, in awesome. retrospect, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Awesome Paint Job says I personally like the look of fantasy on the table more than forty K. Mm -hmm. But Awesome Paint Job, which one do you like to play? He doesn't play either, really. You don't really play? He doesn't play. No, he's, he's a hobby guy. He takes crap out of his thing. But... He spends all his time perfecting his craft. Yeah. And it well, shows. But but it's true, though. I mean, if you put fantasy on the table, it does look really like... Oh, it's That's beautiful. why it looks intimidating. But because yeah. it's so gorgeous, it, right. well, assuming that you have someone painting it, correct? Yeah. You know, um, if you have someone painting a whole, like, say, 2,000 point... Uh, high elf army. It's freaking gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you look at the pictures. The colors. You know, if, you, if you look at the codex, and you look at a codex, like say even for Tau, and then you look at a codex for high elves, the high, it's just so pretty. It's just like a freaking yeah. field of, you know, figures marching across the table, versus where you have Tau, where they're like, okay, let's take like this. Two inch by two inch area and stick all our models in the <laughs> corner of the table. Then they had to, to pick yeah. out to make it look big. I mean, you yeah. can tell just by looking at the pictures, you know, when they do the studio shots that um, they're just so much more involved, at least aesthetic wise, with uh, fan. Yes, exactly. Um, let's see, we have another comment. Rich9517 says, to me, nothing looks better than a block of 60-plus skellies racked up, well-painted, looks good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm pretty sure, though, I mean, even uh, 40K would look, uh, look damn. I mean, even, like, War Machine looks damn awesome. When it's all your, everything's all painted up really good. You know, yes, I love how their, how their miniatures look. 
Yeah. So I mean, I if you put anything on the table that's really painted up good, it'll blow you know, it'll blow yes. everyone's mind away. Because a lot of times when you go to the game shop and you're dealing with gamers, they're gamers. They're not painters. Right. right? They're not hobbyists. So right. they'll be like, oh, you know, all right, prime it, slap first color, second color, third color, and I'm yeah. done. And yeah. all it looks like is, you know, oh, I, the guy just slapped paint on him. He took a, butt, a paint butt, put all his figures together and then dump the paint. Yeah. Ta- tabletop ready, that's it. Yeah, tabletop yeah. ready and that's it. So, you know, you look at it and you're like, oh, it looks, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you have people commission stuff or are actually hobbyists and paints everything. Like, see Michelle, she paints all her stuff and she does it really good, too. So it looks good on the table, you know. So no matter what you put, you put two figures on the table, one figure, and you're like, oh wow, that's great, you look good. You know, that's so why I get a lot of slack. Everybody yeah. says to me, "Don't you have anything that's painted?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I can't just I can't just put you know three colors on it and just boom. I mean, you know, I have to have you know facial tones that are 18 layers on it. It, it <laughs> it's just you know it's just ridiculous and. Yeah. I, it's overtaxing for myself, but it has to look good. Yeah. And it's been like that since since I was younger. I, I've always pushed myself to to make my armies look boss on the table, you know? I think that was one of the uh, older rules back in the heyday, and I think James would remember this, is that in tournaments, they required you to have it painted uh, yeah. three colors up. That's why that's where it came from, the three colors up thing. Yeah. Is that in, in the tournaments, they say at least three colors to yeah. mm-hmm. the tournament. Now they just say, well, you just won't get a painting, you know, whatever. You won't get a painting award or be judged if you don't have a big painting. Yeah. It, it became a problem after a while when, when they were trying to enter all these competitions and people don't have their stuff painted so they can't play. You know, so they changed the rules around and they just say, well, let's just make it into a painting competition. Yeah. You know, Family of Gamers. Work. Family of Gamers 777 says, I don't think there are taboos anymore. We all, all go to see sci-fi, fantasy, superhero movies. You gravitate to what you like, and more important, what your friends play. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So if your friends play 40K, guess what? If you want to play a game, you're going to have to learn 40K. <laughs> uh, it depends. There's still taboos out there, I think. So yeah. Those words still hide behind our little... Thing. No, I don't play them. Make sure plastic figures... You know. <laughs> To, you know, and try to hide the fact that they play. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's still out there, but people just don't understand. It's just, they don't understand it, you know? Mm-hmm. You know you, uh, your family go, oh, wow, look what cute little, you know, toy soldiers you have. Oh, I spent, yeah, that whole army cost me like 2000 bucks or something. And they look right. Like, I work yeah. with a guy like that. He yeah. uh, loads me up with resin bases all the time, and he's like, just don't tell anybody that I uh, I do this stuff, okay? You know, just, wow. uh, oh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I true. I mean, you just look at it, and, and the people. Well, I think the biggest problem nowadays is like, oh, it's not that I play fantasy or or sci-fi little miniature game. It's that I spent two thousand dollars on this, you know, handful yeah. of figures, and then yeah. you yeah. understand why. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah, I think that taboos are still there. It's just that with the advent of the internet, we're with so much of our own kind, and we talk to a lot of people ourselves that we don't. The people that don't really understand aren't really an issue anymore because we have the people that we talk to. Well, uh, that's true. That I mean, that that is a. I think you made a good point. That I think with nowadays with the media, which I didn't have like uh, when I was younger playing Dungeons and Dragons when everyone still thought it was devil worshiping. Um, that we didn't have the media to inform people what it is. You know, mm-hmm. it's like now we have. It's it's just like the whole thing. Everyone thinks that the end of the world's coming because of global warming because all these weird, strange weather is happening. You know, that stuff's always been happening. It's just that now we have smartphones and stuff recording all this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, we have, you know, and it spreads the knowledge out there. I think it's the same thing with, you know, this whole thing about playing video games and literature games and all that stuff that we have this media out there now that's informing people what it is. So it doesn't look as taboo as it usually was before. Yeah, absolutely. Should we move on to the next topic? Uh, I don't know. Have we really? I mean, what else have people been saying? Here? Uh, oh, you know, um, Coach actually made another, you know, good reference about uh, how terrain's often overlooked. Yes. You know, I think that's a big deal too. A lot. Of, it's it's funny because I think uh, less. Com- no, he didn't. He bitched about this, but it's not really bitching. He's just like, you know, what sucks is that I, you know, 
go to a, a game store and the people are putting down these awesome painted armies and you have like a coke can that has the fucking power. <laughs> you know, the books as a hill type of thing. It yep. just destroys the illusion. You know? And uh, that's one of the things like we will not do a battle rep unless all your shit's painted and uh, and, and, and stuff like that. It's do you just, agree with that? Yeah, I do. You think it should oh, all yeah. be painted? I think See, a lot of a lot of things, a lot of attraction uh, to getting new people into this this hobby is they walk in by the store or something. Mm -hmm. Walk in, they see people play this, and and it it doesn't look as impressive unless there's like awesome terrain on the table with right. these awesome mm -hmm. players playing. Yeah, you know, then it just gets a but you know if you're sitting here like you're moving, you know, gummy bears across a table full of books stacked up as hills and stuff. It doesn't look as impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. The I, reality I... of it is, is uh, uh, it's really a hobby first, and then the gaming is kind of secondary to to the whole thing. And I think that's you know, Games Workshop and and uh, Privateer Press have kind of em tried to emphasize that whole thing, that that's how they kind of want it to be, and that's why they're they're trying to push these highly detailed kits. And if they didn't want it to be that way, you have like the Reaper Bones kind of detail and, and all that stuff. So I think that's kind of what's important to look at too. Yeah. When I first got into it, I was very lighthearted about it. I was like, oh, I'll put them together and then, you know, field them, play them. I didn't realize how important it was or actually how strict people were about why aren't your why aren't they at least primed? You need to at least prime these guys. <laughs> you right. can't just bring them out gray. I'm like Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't know that there were rules. You know, <laughs> I, I have to paint them for. I had no clue. I was so lighthearted about it. I still try to be lighthearted and easygoing about it. But yeah, a lot of people will get. They they take it very seriously and get will get upset about it. Like, how dare you? You know, like insult the game by not having your miniature painted. And I'm start. I'm I'm slowly starting to adopt that attitude, and I hate that, but. I understand it. I understand it. I think it has to do a lot with pride too, because a lot of us that play are also hobbyists. So, like, the newbie comes in and go, "Oh, I just want to play this game," and then mm -hmm. you look at them and you kind of like sniffle, you know, but yeah, um, well, I'm not gonna because <laughs> that you have one figure that's not painted or even primed, so uh, move on. Yeah, but you don't want to deter the beginner either. If it, like, what helped me was people kindly, gently let me know. Okay, darling, what you need to do is you need to paint it first. Let's make it fun, okay? I'm like, oh, okay. You know, this I didn't. Is I didn't and there's nothing fun about it. It's all serious business. <laughs> huh? What was that? It's all serious business. This is war gaming. I know. It has, it has I nothing know. to do with fun. It's about putting a good army on the table that's painted and smashing your opponent's to hell. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Uh, man. That, if you can't do that, then why not? Man, man up. Man up. Yeah, man up. Your army. <laughs> You're gonna do it right to do it right oh, now. That's the right. That's out. right. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we were talking about taboos earlier, and I think that we've replaced a lot of taboos. But within the community, we have our own. Like not having painted figures is a taboo. Nowadays, I think, I think nowadays, when not having painted figures is taboo because nowadays you got YouTube where you can learn how to paint this stuff. Mm -hmm. And second, it's really not hard to three color up. Take three colors, three cans of colors or spray, spray paint, and then you just go shoop, 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 and you're done. It only takes yeah. like 10 minutes. Put all your figures in the row or on the table and just go shoop, shoop, shoop. And you get Make it sound so easy. Back. It is easy. It's because you're the three expert. Colors up and you do it, and it looks like it's painted. You know, as, as long as they don't look at your figures and go, oh, the stuff is not painted, right? <laughs> you know, up to your eye, then, you know, that's when you smack them in the head. Shut up, it's painted, let's play. Catherine says, I'm so used to painting fantasy, I struggle to paint in organics. That is like the opposite of me. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. I don't know. I think it's easy to paint. That's why yeah. she's so impressive. The Catherine. Yeah, she, well, she also does, she's also old school too. It's very weird because there's two school of thoughts too that yes. you're dealing with. And touching upon what Coach says. Chung D and D was about the game. Remember how crappy the minis were at the beginning. Um, now that's going far back. That was like back in the days when wargaming wasn't space minis. It was Napoleon. 
or it was recreating Lord of the Rings battle of whatever, mm -hmm. or or you know or or you know World War Two stuff, the historical stuff, where you know when you know when you mentioned that back then it was like oh it's the fat guy that doesn't you know shower and has Dorito chips in his beard <laughs> type of you know stereotype. Like that. But it's true though because back then I think you know. And I don't know if James role plays. But back then, me, me and Coach talk about it all the time because we're old school role players too. We're, we're the type of guys that sit down and don't use figures and play the play the mind game, play the magic, mm -hmm. uh, magic to marry uh, RPG game. Because even RPG is totally different now, nowadays. Um, is that you know we look at it and we're like, oh, psh, you guys play with what figures? We play with our minds. You know, we're like we're like Jedi's. We're going around you know imagining this whole world like. You need figures to tell you where everything goes, and it's kind of like that mindset of you know fantasy versus uh, 40k, and why fantasy has a lot more, I think, overplays. It's that whole old school feel. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with that. Yeah. Um. I think. Uh... GT Technic says part of the reason to paint the armies well and do nice painting is to get immersed into the feeling. When the opponent brings unpainted models, it kind of makes it that impossible, which mm -hmm. is true. We touched on that. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, if I have this huge, totally painted, everything painted, awesome army, and I want to put it on the table with some awesome terrain, then your opponent comes and everything's all prime white. You just look at it and go, I can't get into this. I mean, I get slack from doing a, um, the last uh, battle rep I did with Fantasy, and I bought my friend's high elves. Um, he had uh, tons of unpainted models because he started putting models on the table and didn't use before the last codec. So I'm, you know, I, I'm supposed to post <laughs> that rep and then I get messages, you know, comments saying, why don't you ever paint your stuff? Or, dude, this is my stuff. They're like, you know, it's just like, dude, I'm a painter. I just, just you know, you still get slack from that, from just mm -hmm. people watching battle reps. And I think that's kind of important why we have that rule where we, when we make a battle rep, we want to make sure everything's at least you know, three colors up. Well, that's one of the yeah. things too. You spent you spent probably about three weeks putting together a two thousand point army, scraping the mold lines off, putting everything together, and you just don't want to bother painting everything right away just to play it. You want to you want to make a list, bring it down to the shop, try it out, then try to fix the bugs, figure out what you want to add to the list or take away to the list too. Mm -hmm. That's how I am. And if somebody wants to say, well, your stuff's gray, I'm going to say, too bad. I'm trying to figure out what I need to add to my list or take away, and then I'll paint it, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah. we'll go from there. So that's one of the, that's one of the downfalls to, to me is, um, you know, I'm still... Well, sometimes you just want to play the damn game, right? Yeah, yeah and, and, and it can be discouraging. It can be discouraging, especially to a beginner who is so excited to just play a game, you know, and then be like, okay, you have to wait two months because you have to get it all painted. Yeah. I, I think that people that have been playing a while forget that, that, that yeah. zeal that beginners have. Yeah. And they, they still have that, you know, they have fire in their belly, they want to just get on the board and play. And I don't think mm -hmm. there's anything wrong with that. Just maybe slowly encourage them. Yeah. Along the way, okay, now let's let now let's let the next step be to paint your your little guys. Yeah. Right, paint a you know, unit. Not, paint a unit. Not to scare them unit. off and be like, you have to have it painted before mm -hmm. you even set them down on the table. You know that that's like, oh, you know what? Forget you, man. Bye. You don't want to discourage them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's there's uh, there's a line that you that I draw on certain places is that um, I know in our store we had one guy that used to bring paper hammer. And I tease that guy like, like <laughs> no tomorrow. Like he'll put a tank on the table that can paper crap. I'm like, dude, are you serious? <laughs> Don't put that shit on the table. I'll, I will kick your, I will smash your tank. And I did that before. <laughs> I was walking by and he was playing someone. I smashed one of his tanks. I'm we like, got a guy like bring this oh my too. goodness. I'm like, don't bring this shit on the board. I mean, not 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 in my game store. I mean, it's not. I don't own the game store, but you know, <laughs> my game store. Why would you? You know, why would you come here and, you know, kind of insult everyone and the game store? <laughs> saying, oh, I don't want to buy a pot. I just want to come and play and fold everything in origami. You know, <laughs> origami 40K type of thing. I'm like, no, I don't think so. 
Yeah. But it looks cool. I don't know. It doesn't look cool. It looks stupid. I spent like, you know, 80 bucks on my tank. You yeah. should be spending 80 bucks on your tank. So, yeah. Uh, Get it off the table. He actually made it out of paper. He made a lot That's, of you no. Know, he had figures too, but a lot of it was oh, I can't afford it. So let's make it out of paper. So oh, we'll so and make up paper. Yeah, uh, the I. You know what? I do craft. agree with you. I do yeah. agree with you. We all have to fork out a little bit of dough. <laughs> right. Well, and I, you know, I told him I go look, go get like a sheet of styrene and make your, you know, tank out of that. At least you put yeah, some freaking effort exactly. into it. Yeah, exactly, right. yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, oh, he's like, I put effort in it. It took me an hour to do it. Yeah, it took you an hour to fold up a piece of paper still. So don't give me that version. Awesome. You know, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm like, I'm, I'm an ass that way. I'm an asshole that way, you know. I'm, I'm also an asshole about not painting the models. I mean, it, it's one thing to have, like, not, like, two or three units painted. I understand that, and the rest of the shit thing, yeah. But don't. Feel the whole white army against me. Right, right. You know, awesome then, paint job says your models are bringing down the property value. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is that's true. That, I mean, you gotta look at it. And then yeah. if I own a game store, I I I'd probably go out of business and I scare away all the new people. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, you, you would. I, I can't would. I would. I would say I would have a standing rule <laughs> on on the wall, big old black letters. <laughs> You cannot play if your arm, you know, if your figures are not painted. If 80% <laughs> of your arm is not painted, do not come and play. You know? Don't George, ever put paper crap in my George game. says, Chung, bullying it in all wrong, in, blah, 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 I can't talk. Chung, bullying <laughs> it wrong in all forms. <laughs> no, it's not about bullying, it's about having freaking pride. I mean, <laughs> I, I have higher expectation in this hobby because I do all of it. I paint it and I play it and stuff like that, right? You know, like yeah. a lot of hobbies, like, oh, yeah, look at this. This is great. I'm like, great, but I can't put that on the board. Got, your base is too fucking high. <laughs> you know, you're going to, you know, you know, line of sight, idiot. You know, yeah. But I'm painting it for a cup. I don't give a shit. How am I going to put that on the table if I bought that from you? <laughs> What's the point of you painting a nice looking figure if I can't put it on the table? You know, yeah. shit's too oh, high, man. man. You know, if I bought it, I'm going to saw that shit in half just so I can put it you're, on the table. You're so feisty. I love it. <laughs> love it. I just do it just to be an asshole. <laughs> I really don't give a shit, honestly. I just. Like, <laughs> I, I can just see Chung smashing the tank. No, oh, it failed its saving roll. Me smash. <laughs> well, Miss knows. He hangs around with Mario and stuff, and I'm pretty. I'm a real big ass to Mario, but I do it because I love him. But he'll, he'll come every time. He'll like say, you know, oh, how do I do my video? I go, did you use your flip camera for that fucking video? <laughs> What's the problem? I'm all in pride in what you're doing. Go get a camcorder. I don't have enough money. I go bullshit. You have enough money to buy all these figures. Go get a damn yeah. camera. Yeah, but I do that. I know. I know Les does that tomorrow too. But you know, we're friends, and you know, he knows what how 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 much of an ass I can be sometimes. How long but have I you and Les known each other? Um, a couple of years now. Yeah. Just curious. <laughs> that was a big segue. I wasn't going anywhere with it. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I know. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, but I think a lot, a lot of it has to do with pride. I mean, especially when someone puts a well painted, fancy army, you gain a lot of my respect. Yeah. If you yeah. put you know, a fancy army at the end, versus like someone putting their damn ultramarine. Army on the table, I'm like, dude, that's just blue smurfs. I don't, that doesn't impress me. <laughs> you painted it blue, put some decals on it, and that's basically it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, unless you go with less type of style or, you know, those iron painters where, you know, each each troop figure has, like, this awesome highlighting. And no matter where you see it, you know, the sun's always in, in different places. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thing, you know, it doesn't impress me. I but miss the days of, of, uh, Pulling all nighters before a tournament to try to get the the one unit finished so that my whole army was painted to try to win best painted uh, in the tournament because I knew I was never going to win um, and the only way I was going to try to win was trying to get best painted or something and uh, I would stay up drink coffee you know pots of coffee to try to get the unit painted and uh, those days are I miss that kind of stuff you know and. I, I just feel that you don't need to do that anymore. And I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that, but I just really miss those days. Kind of. I know. Well, I kind of understand what you're saying because a lot of times nowadays it hurts it hurts my heart when I see people yeah. just like, oh, I just want to play the game. I go, yeah, but it's not painted. Yeah. But, yeah, but we're just playing a game, right? I go, yeah, but it's not painted. You know, yeah. and that, that's the only thing in my head. It's like it's not – you didn't even put the effort of – spitting on it 
Yeah. I mean, I, I did that. I did that with the the tournament that I met you at with my Space Wolves. I sat up all night just painting those suckers, you know. And uh, now I just don't have time to paint my own stuff because I've I, because as a result of my Space Wolves in that tournament, I picked up some commissions and stuff, and now I'm just doing that. And it's <laughs> I sit and I look at my stuff and I get razzed because all my stuff is gray. Everybody well, that's else. the other thing too. I think you know the the standards of what uh, the old school thinking versus nowadays school thinking is that it just went it lowered the bar. Like everything yeah. in life nowadays, everything the bar is lowered for the stupid people, kind of. Yeah. Because I, the oracle. The proof, the proof is this: is I painted a figure, brought it to the store, and then like and put it on the table because we we're, were playing fantasy, and the guy said, like, "Oh my god, that's so, so awesomely painted! One of my worst painted models ever." He's looking at it, he goes, wow, look at the details. I go, you know what? That's what I figured out. You could fake your ass way becoming yeah. the best painter in the world by painting every single little detail a different color on your model. Because yeah. they don't, you know, I was like, you don't have to highlight. You just slap the damn red paint, you know, green and red on the feathers. Right? Yeah. And then whatever. As long as all the details are painted, it looks, they'll look good to the normal people. It I, looks course, complete. Yeah, it looks complete. Of course, yes. I can show it to Les and he goes, what the hell is wrong with yeah, you? Yeah, well, yeah, no. <laughs> you do <laughs> the worst paint job ever, you know. Yeah. So, if you're talking to a non-painter and more to the game, right. side, you can get away right. with it. Yeah. So you can go, go pay a commission, go pay a commission service five bucks to help three color up your damn army and you'll be good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chong, yeah. what, what do you say to the Oracle? Not everyone has time to dedicate to painting and they just want to have some fun playing with friends when they get a little time off. That's fine if they want to play with their friends, just don't play with me. Oh. <laughs> the, damn, oh. you know, the Oracle. I mean, in, in all honesty, though, I'm just kidding. I mean, I, I'll you know, play with like the Oracle. Again. I'll play with you. <laughs> again, there's, <laughs> there's two, well, really three schools of, of thought in this whole hobby right now. The hobbyist, that all they do is paint. Uh, the gamer, where they, all they care about is gaming. Right. And then the hobby uh, and gaming, which is the, probably the worst of them all because since you're a painter, you want them all to look good. Yes, but you want to get them on the table. So you rush your paint job just to get right. that table. So yeah. it, it really is the, the school of thought. There's people who could give, you know, care less if the army is painted. They just want to play the game, which makes sense. Yeah. That's fine too. You know. Max Payne thirty nine says, "Hey, ultramarines <laughs> aren't as easy to paint as you make it sound." <laughs> I agree. Yes, it <laughs> is. A, guys, you paint blue and little you paint details. the damn thing. That is coming from the Lord of Ultramarines. Right coming there. from the expert. <laughs> Look, all right, here's how you paint a squad of Ultramarines, all right? Yes, do tell. Do tell. All right, all right, all right. Blue, blue, ten, ten ultra, Ultramarines on, on a block of stick. Okay. <laughs> Take a can of blue paint that looks yeah. really blue. Spray it all up. Yeah. Right? Yep. Take a white, you know, oil marker or whatever and just go. <laughs> All right, oil marker? What's an oil it? marker? Oil like marker? This. Like this. These things. Like, you know how, like, kids, you know, like, little girls at school use these markers to, you know, decorate their, like, folders and stuff yeah, yeah, like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Tommy. <laughs> just grab one of those on the staple. And, just look, and you got details, right? And that's your ultimate. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> or just make little horseshoes on the you know shoulder pad and you got all two right there. That's right. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll go with it. Yeah, Not and you know what? I'm Eldar. making fun of ultramarines because I'm taking digs at the coach right now that I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But anyways, uh, wow, this did this topic did go pretty long. So, uh, is there any anything else that you guys want to kick in on this topic? Yes. Yeah. Family of Gamers says, just try your best. It's a hobby. Should be fun. Agreed. Mm -hmm. No, it's not a Absolutely. hobby. As I said, it's serious <laughs> business. Either you do it right or don't do it at all. Either you win or you're a loser for life, all right? Never, go, never, never settle for mediocrity, Coach. All right? uh, you either win or you don't win. He of all people should know this. I know, right? He's the him. <laughs> Why is he saying it should be fun? He's like the most, one of the most competitive guys out there. Yeah. You know why? It's because he played Grey Knight and he loses. I don't know how yep. he does that. I know. Oh. Oh, Burn. Ow. Zynga. Burn. I would get my ass kicked. Coach, yeah. you need some ointment for that burn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why don't we go, uh, uh, James, uh, what, yes. what, what, what did you want to cover there? Well, you know, 
a lot through the internet as I as I kind of cruise through it. A lot of people, um, as we've also been reminiscing about the the past um, with uh, the games, I wanted to talk about you know, 40k through the ages, and uh, people have been digging a lot about sixth edition and how they don't like it. And I just wanted to talk about the different editions and how uh, we see uh, 40k now. And the one, the big thing for me is the the changes throughout the editions. Second edition uh, is when I kind of started. I didn't play Rogue Trader because I think that was kind of more of a, a role playing, small little thing. Um, yeah, I played Rogue Trader. There's nothing wrong with it. Like, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, uh, we didn't like, really well, have it. That there was no limit to it. I mean, we were feeling 10,000 point armies and didn't have to call it hockey. Right, right. Yeah. Um, it wasn't in my hometown at the time, so I wasn't really introduced to it at the time, so I, I had no clue. But uh, I remember second edition, seeing it in my shop, and I, at first I despised it. I was a fantasy guy. I had my Empire Army. Um, I was seeing the goofy Space Wolves Codex sitting on the rack, seeing the the um, Razorbacks and all this stuff. People were playing 40K, and um, the rules just seemed so crazy. But for some reason, I just I wanted to play it. Just out of the blue, I just thought, this, let's try it. And uh, I did. And I fell in love with it right away. The rules um, were very complicated. Um and I think that, that was kind of the lure of it for me. It was very or complicated, what, like K? fantasy. Which, which edition was this? Uh, second edition. Second edition. This was, yeah, this is the time when Terminators had uh, two up armor save on 3D6. Um, your assault cannons on Terminators would jam. And uh, you had war gear, di uh, war gear cards. Every, every person had, um, if you had, a let's say, a bike, you had a war gear card for that bike. You had to take... Um, they had a box that you had to get that had um, the psychic cards for, like, say, Slanesh or Eldar and all this crazy stuff. Um, so if you lost your war gear cards, you're you kind of screwed your whole game up. It was kind of it kind of sucked. Um, I want to let you let me interject really quick. Sure. Uh, people who are watching this live right now, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, we don't we're not paying attention to the uh, YouTube comments anymore. Uh, we're just watching what's happening on our chat channel here with what's going on in the live show. Uh, sure. We have this whole interface set up, so if you if you want to get in on the chat, it's at www.wgconsolium.com and uh, sign up there and then join in our live chat uh, over there and we'll, we'll, ask, we'll answer your questions with that. Sorry about that. Go for it. No problem. Uh, second edition was a very hero-based edition where you tooled up your heroes and nobody else mattered. Um, which which was pretty cool. Uh, you could throw grenades. Your whole your whole uh, unit could throw a grenade. Um, Overwatch was there, which was pretty awesome. So so Overwatch was an older rule they had. Absolutely, yeah. Um, there was sustained fire dice, which I forget what the actual rule was for sustained fire, but um, I remember that it was actually kind of complicated, especially when you were firing against the unit uh, a mob of orcs. Uh, vehicle damage charts were location specific, so if you hit the the rear, uh, it would do a certain thing to the tank and mm -hmm. uh, and whatnot. The big change came with third edition. Uh, third edition was actually a very scary time for 40k players when they streamlined the rules. Um, they took away Overwatch. They took away um, a lot of the the wonky rules with the jamming of the assault turn, uh, cannons and uh, this is when the the box that actually introduced a lot of the Xenos, uh, you you got to see the Dark Eldar come, and uh, they had the Black Templars in the box set with uh, the Dark Eldar. This was their first introdu introduction, and uh, it was pretty much the neutering of the game. Um, this is when they simplified it for what we kind of thought were for kids. Um, so you saw a. a Deviation from the complication of a fantasy style game to to um, almost like what we see now. Popcorn, uh, yeah, uh, beer, yeah. popcorn. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
So it, the box set was kind of cool. Uh, you had they gave you nice terrain. Games Workshop at the time was actually really generous to the to the people. Uh, White Dwarf was giving you ter uh, card terrain in the actual magazines. Um, Sisters of Battle was coming out. Um, Necrons and Tower coming out near the end of the gen uh, the thing. Um, but all those all those little beneficial rules that you saw, like Overwatch and all this stuff, were were gone. And people, you know, when you see big change like that, people kind of go, "What the heck?" Um, and people just they. I think just like with 6th edition, people just kind of say, well, I don't want to play anymore. This is stupid. And uh, they stop. But um, with the, when people stop shaking, they come back to it. 4th edition was a revision of, of a third. It was basically 3.5. Um, close combat is where we saw the uh, everybody within two inches um, gets to fight. 3rd edition didn't have that. And uh, pile-in moves were starting to come. Um, defensive weapons and offensive weapons on tanks came. And the big, the big difference with fourth edition was the introduction of the mini rule book, which was actually really cool because it was the Battle McCraig uh, box set, which if you were a Tyranid player, everybody fell in love with. Because uh, you got the Tyranids, uh, the Gene Steelers, and the Gaunts, and all that stuff, so that was pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't play Fourth Edition. I had to stop at the time because that's when I entered the monastery. So uh, it's kind of like, obviously, I couldn't play at the time, but uh, <laughs> it seemed pretty cool. Uh, fifth Edition, we all know Fifth Edition. If you're a 40k player, Fifth Edition yeah. was that the was introduction last year. Yeah. Yeah. Introduction of mechanized uh, warfare, really. Uh, tanks became really hardy. Everybody loved using transports. Everyone was tilting melted guns. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now we have 6th edition. And uh, people... The, the nice thing about 6th edition is that it's kind of a throwback to all of the editions throughout, throughout 40K. <laughs> And we have people that sit there and say, well, it's, it's just fantasy and, and all this stuff. And it's really not. It's, it's 40K 2 through, through 5. We have Overwatch brought back. Um, it's different because you don't declare your unit being on Overwatch. And whoever comes within a certain range, you get to fire at them. Right. Um, obviously, uh, you, you know the rule. Um, but it's there. Uh, we have throwing grenades back, which is, you know, pretty awesome. Um, we have a huge war gear. We have war gear selection for our troops again now for our characters, which we didn't really have in, in third and fourth. So I don't really think it's it's a, a reintroduction going back to fantasy. I think it's just bringing back the a lot of the cool rules that, the, the players missed from the older days. There's uh, When I was going through the internet, there was actual movements of people trying to bring back uh, fa uh, 40k second edition. Move your camera down a little bit. Or you have to set up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because, <laughs> you know, we love watching your forehead while you talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a whole movement of people trying to bring back uh, 40k second edition. Yeah. So, you know, I, I really want to be part of that movement. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't need. <laughs> we really don't need to. We have sixth edition now, which is still growing in popularity. Uh, it's a big explosion. Um, so that's that's, you know, that's. So you're what saying I want to talk that about. all the complaints about the sixth edition really isn't that it's like really nothing to it because all they're doing is bringing back the old rules that made the game fun. Yes, fifth absolutely. Edition, I gotta admit that fifth edition, because when I started back in the, I originally started with forty k before I even hit fantasy when I was, you know, like, like when I was thirteen or fourteen when I played it, and then uh, when I got back into this, I started with fantasy, and then into forty k. When I started fantasy, that was like eighth edition just came out. So when I played my first game with uh, one of my friends, the Painting Clinic, which some of you guys might know his channel. Mm -hmm. Um, we, most of the game was us, like, we play. it was like eight hours at a convention, it took about eight hours to play the whole damn game, 
And about five hours, that's flipping through the book. Okay, because there are just so many rules to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I jumped to 40K, that was fifth edition. Uh, like in, in, in the heyday of fifth edition, the prime time of fifth edition where everyone's mm -hmm. playing it. Like crazy, and the rules were so like simple. I was just like, "Wow, this is such a different, you know, ad atmosphere." So I see that coming from you know sixth edition coming from that point of view. That when they release sixth, sixth edition, I'm like, "All right, well, why do I want to play you know 40k when I just go play fantasy again?" Because they brought so many rules that I thought was from the uh, you know, the uh, the fantasy uh, game. You just gotta remember uh, between Rogue Trader. And fifth edition was this huge gap that I never, mm -hmm. I haven't played in. I played a little like third edition, I think, but then you know at that time I was in college. I was worried. I was more about getting drunk and yeah. partying and, and women. But, always important, of course. Yeah, and playing with yeah. um, you know, lots of fingers. So you know when so from my point of view, I jumped in and then from fifth edition with the sixth edition. I'm like, what is this? This right. is kind of silly for fifth right. edition. Right. You know, but I didn't know that they had like Overwatch and Second Edition and that. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool that you covered all that. Pretty much some people start pitching and just play the game. Yeah, and I think I think the the one thing that we gotta kind of remember too is that 40k is uh, everybody looks at 40k as the big 2000 point 1850 kind of game, but we also have I'm gonna show this book and everybody just sits there and kind of cringes when I show this book. We have Crusade of Fire. Um, the hell is that? Yeah, this is this is a uh, it's a campaign book that came out a little while ago, just after the Chaos came out, or maybe yes, about that's November. Order only type of book? Uh, no, it was released. Um, you can get it. Uh, yeah, it was kind of special order, but it was released. They didn't do it like they did um, with the the more current stuff, but it's. A lot of people say it's just uh, you know advertising for Games Workshop stuff, and it really kind of is. But it does give you uh, a campaign uh, inspiration and in how to do it. Um, it does have the uh, the flying stuff with um, the rules for um, burning skies and uh, dog fights and all this stuff. And it does have a lot of cool things in the background. Like you can you can have gladiator fights with um, characters from uh, the dirt. Dark Eldar, like they were caught by the Dark Eldar. You can make little rules for that. There's a lot of, you know, you can fight on demon worlds. People people don't understand that there's so much to, of the aspect of 40K that is very cinematic. Just to be able to fight on a, a demon world where demons pop up out of nowhere, you know, you can have a little 500-point game and have a lot of fun with it. You don't need to have an 1850-point game or a 3,000-point game all the time. But see, you can here, have... Here's the problem. When I, when I look at um, Warhammer in itself, Fantasy 40K, I, that's, only, that's one of the reasons why I play Warhammer Fantasy 40K is because of the epicness. If I want to play skirmish games, I'll go play a skirmish game, but Warhammer for me is not a skirmish game. If I play Warhammer, then I'm, I'm expecting to pull out the 2,000-point army. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, but when they try to, you know, introduce like rules to play smaller games, don't get me wrong. I like Combat Patrol. That's actually kind of fun, mm -hmm. right? But other than Combat Patrol, I can't stand playing a 800 point game. It's just weird. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's just like I rather oh, I'll just go play War Machine. Right. Yeah. You know? Um. Actually, Second Edition with all the crazy rules was actually designed to be a uh, a skirmish right. game. Because of all the crazy rules you had to go through, and with all the uh, the mechanics of the game, uh, it wasn't designed to have um, more than I'd say a thousand points. Um, it, it the character building and everything being centered around the characters, just like in fantasy now, where you had your percentages, and then you have everything to kind of fill in those percentages. There weren't, gotcha. you know, yeah, um, you know, fourth edition actually had the the force or force organization chart kind of come into being and um, that's there weren't prior to that it was all percentages so I mean I don't know I kind of forget where I'm going with that I'm sorry I had a brain fart. <laughs> <laughs> right. so um, I mean um, 10 or, or miss you guys have any questions about, I know 10 when did you start playing uh, 40k 6th edition right yeah 
I only started this like maybe eight months ago, so I'm still in the beginner skirmish phase. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, eight months I, ago, so did you just come in? Yeah, I guess you did come in that sixth edition, then, right? Yeah. Just like the end of fifth. Did you even try any fifth edition, or were you just painting? At that point? No, and you know I haven't had time to like read any of the fluff or. Uh, right now, I'm focusing on painting and tutorials and um, playing small games. That's kind of where I'm at right now. Oh, so yeah, you don't. So it's, it's impressive cool. when I see someone play this huge point game. I get lost. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. <laughs> no, it's okay. I still get lost. There's there are times where I like go, okay, I'm done, and then the guys go, the other the opponents go, and I realize, oh, I should have to move this unit. You know. Like <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. All right. Thanks. Um, let's go ahead and move on to Mrs. Topic. Um, uh, what were you bringing uh, to the table here? Uh, my topic is uh, something we're all familiar with: Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. Over the past few months, we have been hit by a barrage of Kickstarters: a Chaos Ball, Raging Heroes, um, trans like Dread Ball, all these. Wild West Exodus, Drake's War Game. Yeah. All that other stuff. Okay. And there's so many of them. I'm getting to wonder are we going to start getting oversaturated with new games coming out? Or the old developers bringing out new things? Because, I mean, if you look at a lot of gamers, they're going to play what their friends have or something, they're not going to keep going out and buy these new games if their friends aren't going to play with them. Because there's a lot of us, but we're still a very niche market to where we, we play with people we can find. Because not all of us have game stores and all of that. Right. And if there's more and more games coming out all the time, it's going to keep watering down everything to the point where People, I'm going to wonder if people are going to start like being hesitant on spending more money, especially gamers. For the hobbyists, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's going to affect them as much because it's just new things to paint for them. They don't have the investment of, okay, are my friends going to play this? Are my friends going to play that? In the same sense where, like I said, with gamers. And with all the new Kickstarters out there, are they going to start failing because people aren't going to want money? Are they going to want to spend their money on the new thing coming out of the Kickstarter? And if if these new Kickstarter going to start failing, is that going to stop like like old developers from trying it? Or is it going to make people like, oh, well, this looks cool. Should I try this? I don't know if it's going like, to stop the creativity from actually flowing because we got hit by too much too fast. Okay. Well, here's the thing. We had this conversation on the Facebook group with uh, all the Facebook community. Uh, with someone who was bringing up, uh, I believe, yeah, David brought up something about um, uh, GW, how they, you know, someone made it, uh, some store made a video about GW policies coming up in the UK, which was totally different from the US. And it, it got into a point where it always gets into, it doesn't matter what GW say, they're still full of shit type of thing. And it, and it goes all the way to the point where we said, look, if GW doesn't change their ways, with Kickstarter, there's like tons of new games coming up. Yeah. Right? And I mentioned, I go, yeah, it, it's, it's going to help a lot of companies kickstart. It's going to help a lot of companies come up into the fold over that hill that uh, they wouldn't have it without crowdfunding. But the problem is, is I'm waiting for the bubble to burst, which is exactly what you're talking about. You saturate everything with so many Kickstarters. First of all, people are going to start running out of money to spend on certain Kickstarter. Yeah. And then second, it's going to start bringing out, since it's so easy to crowdfund a new company now and bring up a product line and, and you know have it spread all over the place, um, we're still putting out money for a product that we don't own. We're only like yeah. seeing conceptual art and stuff. Okay, so when the, the, when the Kickstarting fad, that's what I'm going to call it, Mm -hmm. uh, gets oversaturated. Sooner or later, we're going to have companies that are going to come out and say, "Oh, hey, you know, Kickstarter our project. Wow, the, all the concept art looks yeah. great." And then you know, you get a, a, you know, and then when you finally get it in the mail, it's it's one of the worst figures ever out there, yeah, you know, or one of the worst gameplays ever, because that's already happened already. 
There's some companies that had this conceptual idea, brought it to Kickstarter, people bought into it. Finally, when they got the game, they're like, oh, this is so horrible. Right. You know, it was like, and it, it, doesn't, it didn't go anywhere because after the kick, kickstart, you know, um, it was all conceptually good, but when you put it down, you know, on paper, when you put it down to the table, people were like, I hate this game. It's one yeah. of the worst, you know, game ever. Or this product's uh, quality sucks. You know, sooner or later we're going to get flooded with, with that kind of market that people are just going to start being wary about. Uh, you know, putting money into a game that comes out of Kickstarter. And then yeah. we're all going to get into that passive state where we're like, yeah, Kickstarter, who cares? I'm like, you know, unless it looks yeah. really, really awesome or that company has some kind of backing, I'm not going to put any money into it anymore. Yeah, and then it's going to yeah. burst. The bubble's going to burst. Yeah, and that's kind of one of the things that I was, um, one of the points I was trying to make is that we are going to start getting to this passive thing like, okay, we've been burned one too many times. And then there's going to be that that one company that makes this incredible game, yeah. and since everyone's been burned and they're wary, it's not going to get funded because no one's willing to take that risk again. Right, um, and it won't gain steam, and it won't ever see the light of day. Yeah. No, that's the problem. Is you know, like you said, it's right because it's going to get to the point where oh, someone released Kickstarter. I never heard of this company. Who cares? Right, and then Magic right. Games released a new board game. They're like, "Oh, I'm definitely buying into this because the last time I put in money for them, they actually created a really awesome game from the conceptual point of view." You know, um, but do any like, of you guys have have miniatures from companies that have done Kickstarters? Uh, yeah, I bought into uh, well, I bought into weird miniatures uh, role playing game. Also got you know a lot of sample. Figures from Kickstarter, like this is from Warzone. Oh, you guys can't see this. I got a couple of figures from Warzone, and then compared to the conceptual art that I saw, because it was all three D rendering, it was CAD renderings of the models, right? Versus what I got in my hand, were actually really good quality. Because oh, I think okay. Warzone is mm -hmm. going to be the next game. I think once they release it, because Warzone used to be a game that competed against GW, and right. what I think happened was GW bought the rights to the game and then shelved oh, it. Wow. Wow. And then I think the people came back and the original guys that created the game bought it back and now they're re releasing it again as mm -hmm. Wars of Resurrection. And I think that's the next game I think would go pretty far if they get if they do it right. Because it was going pretty far when it first came out. Yeah. Yeah, that that actually is a testament to them because Games Workshop is this huge giant and they yeah. are I mean Privateer Press even, I think they have a hard time I don't want to say a hard time, but I think it are competing with them pretty heavy with War Machine. Well, War, War Machine came out like wildfire, and I think you know even companies, even established companies, are jumping into the kickstarting crowdfunding thing because it's a low risk um, yeah. and free marketing, <laughs> as well as free marketing statistics to find to find out if people are interested in a product line before you actually put it even into production. And that's right. what's right. annoying to me about the Kickstarter thing is seeing these these companies that are well established that have the fund uh, the funds to back themselves jumping into the Kickstarter thing and uh, just saying hey give us more money to do this kind of stuff and uh, they're going from there whereas the honest small people that are trying to start something up which is what I think Kickstarter was kind of started for right. um, are trying to use it and I think it's being um, they're being overshadowed by these these big companies yeah. and uh, that, that Kickstarter to me is just so annoying I hear Kickstarter and it's kinda like a curse word to me now yeah so, it's like oh handout yeah we're not doing yeah. anything well yes and no I mean see I, I disagree with that point whereas you know that Kickstarter should only be for startups or what have you um, I would say no to that because if as GW, if, if I was GW, I'd be using Kickstarter left and right. All right, if I wanted Sister Battle to come out without even just doing any weird surveys or marketing, you know, I don't need a marketing department for that anymore. I'll just say, who's interested in Sisters in Battle? All right, if you do buy into it, and if it looks good, if if I make, if I put in and say I want thirty grand and and to start. You know the faction of, of you know sister in battle, like the full codex, everything full blown. Mm -hmm. right? and then I make, and then I get like a pledge of two million. I'll know that's going to go. 
I'm going to put that into production, and I'm going to put production in the future as well. Do you because think they'd get the money, though? Of course mm -hmm. they will. If people yeah. pledge $2 million, it's most likely most, all, mostly all of them will buy it. Mostly because it's that whole porn thing. Give us your credit card information. Now we'll charge you later. Don't forget right. about it, you know, whatever they pledge into. Well, it's a right. really, really anal. And then, you know, next thing you know, you're charged with it. You say, oh, hey, this Kickstarter is done that you pledge into. We're going to charge your card in a week or so. They're not going to use the email. Yeah. But they'll know it when they, it shows up on their you know, statement. Right. So, you know, a lot of people who pledge will forget about that they pledge into it until they say, oh, I forgot. I pledged into this. You know, that's another thing about Kickstarter, that they use that mentality of you pledge now, we'll charge you later. You won't even yeah. Right. No. Um, but it, in, in the aspect of Kickstarters for big companies, I think it, it's not, it shouldn't be just limited to startups. Big companies, it's a huge market too. And I'm surprised that GW didn't jump into that already. You know, big companies haven't jumped into already. Yeah, they oh. have the funds for whatever product line they have now. But you got to remember, they have funds for that product line. Like, yeah. if it was that one game, there is a budget for that one game. If you want to create a whole new game, you got to put money into it, right? You got to, like, get the conceptual artists to draw up the stuff. You got to get the game designers to, you know, design the game. You got to get, uh, all, just on the conceptual stage, it costs a lot of money. Yeah. Right? And for a company, like, if I, if I was a company, for me to, like, say, I'm going to put a million dollars into this new project, it's like putting a million dollars to say, go make this movie, but we'll hope we'll, we'll make all the money back when it's released. It's the same concept, you know, as a game company. If you have a new product line, you got to make sure that you, you make all your money back. Well, when's you going to lose money? Mm -hmm. Right? But yeah. with Kickstarter, you, you get this whole, you know, like preemptive foreshadowing of, of the product, like, right? you know, of, of the interest just generated by, by the pledges. Yeah, so and I think Private, it's a huge tool for you know current markets. Yeah, and Pepper Deer Press is getting into Kickstarter now. Are they really? Yeah, didn't they, they kickstart level seven. I, I think they did. I can't. I'm not even what sure they, anymore. What are they doing one for? Uh, they are actually working to release a video game. Believe it or not. Oh right. Yeah, they're doing uh, War Machine Tactics. Oh yeah. Oh wow. We were talking about that last night. And yeah, I have my reservations about that game because I because I could tell what modeling and what the, yeah. what software they're using to make create that game, and it's just so old school that I, you're looking at it going, why why bother the modeling and every all the things are really like two or three years back, and I, I wouldn't kickstart that. I wouldn't put my money in that only because I well only because I have the programming background to understand what they're doing and how they're making yeah. that game, you know. But it's true, though. Like, you know, Miss said, uh, you know, big companies are already using it. Um, Mantix are using it like crazy. Mantix is just, they're, they're just like, um, just like, you know, squeezing everything out of Kickstarter. And that's, I think that's really smart of them to do. Hmm. Yeah. Kane856 says if GW joined Kickstarter, they'd have to acknowledge that there's a hobby world outside of Lenten. <laughs> that's that's, that's true. probably true. <laughs> oh, Conifee, Con thanks. You corrected me. GW you have nothing to do with Warzone family. I'm not quite exactly sure why Warzone didn't work out. I thought it was GW. Um, also, you know, with the new latest lawsuit, you know, verdict of Chapter House and GW. I think we're going to see a lot of kickstarting for um, uh, companies coming out with their, you know, new figures and accessories for your mm -hmm. war, war machine. Oh, sorry, Warhammer models. Right. And I think that's what's going to make it awesome. That's what I'm watching for. Right. right? And I know there's this upcoming company that looks really, really good. I can't say anything about it now. He's not watching because he's off play. But I've been helping with a new kickstart company come up modeling. Company that do models are coming up, and he's been uh, giving me minutes of uh, minutes of the meetings and stuff like that uh, to see where they're going and stuff. But they, they look fun. And he asked me, he's like, "Well, what do you think people want? Like, well, accessories, make more show pads, and stuff like that." You know, that kind of gonna... stuff is awesome, though. That's that's yeah. what Kickstarter should be. Yeah, that's why I like Cyborg a lot. Cyborg makes mm -hmm. those Celtic, you know, shoulder pads and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I totally fund them on Kickstarter. 
Yeah. See, that's the thing that you have to watch out for. Sooner or later, kids are going to get so saturated, like you mentioned now. Yeah. It's going to. Everything is. All right? But in our hobby for Kickstarter, it's not saturated yet. It's going to get there. Because you're going to have garage kits that could get a 3D printer. Yeah. You say, oh, yeah, I could you know, whip out you know, a thousand figures in my 3D printer in an hour, which obviously don't. Um, or they can't because the technology is still slow for you know, home-based uh, 3D printers and stuff. And me and Les actually talked about this is that, um, uh, you know, we're talking about kickstarting Will or Will Line and stuff, and the, the next, you know, Sasha figure and stuff. And he mentioned, like, a lot of people don't, aren't paying attention about what they're doing for pledges. Because, you know, we see that, we already saw some companies fail because they're pledging, the, the way they made the pledge system is that, they think they're going to make money off of doing, you know, making a company out of it, and what they end up doing is paying out more than uh, what it costs to produce the products and figures and stuff like that. And what happens is that they ended up going out of business because the way they set up the pledging and stuff was completely like um, at the end spending more money than you're getting out of what you're trying to produce. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of things. I think even though you have Kickstarter, you gotta have people who are really freaking stupid that who shouldn't even have business starting a business. Have no business starting a business. Mm -hmm. Like some LSG owners out there. They're wondering why they fail. I go, because you're fucking stupid. You know, you don't know how to sell your products. Right? You, you're, you're like, you're like offending all your customers. You know, no one's going to come buy your stuff. It's the same concept. You need to have that mentality of being a business guy to be able to kickstart a business. You know, you can't just go kickstart. You can't go have an idea and just kickstart it and then that's Doing that at work, you have that savviness, or at least the backup to be able to run a business once it gets kickstarted. Yeah, and I, and I think personally, when that saturation happens, it's gonna it's gonna be these smaller companies are gonna need to talk to people like GW, like Mantic, like Weird, like Preveteer Press, saying, "Look, here's our new thing. We want to we want to do this on Kickstarter. We want to get this funded. Can we have like can we tie in with your company some way?" Yeah, because people are are going to be afraid of these independent companies after a while, and they're That's only going true, to trust right? the big names. And and that might be where it is going. I mean, Kickstarter might be a good way to start a company, but if you don't have that savviness or understand how to run a business and keep it going, sooner or later you're going to have publishers, uh, kickstarting publishers, which I, I, I actually I actually think it will, will go that way. I mean, because you look at it now, before Kickstarters, you had companies like Cinemon. You will take an idea if you go to them and publish your stuff for you know, like a chunk of your profit. And because they are a publisher and a very popular one, uh, most of the products that they, they endorse will, will actually kickstart or uh, actually you know, have uh, spread and, and do successfully well. Mm -hmm. you know, but you have someone like Simon, a published company that knows what they're doing. So this whole Kickstarter is still new and stuff, even for not just our hobby, but all around, all company stuff, but um, because it's all around, it's not just happening to our hobby, it's happening in all the other industries as well, mm -hmm. and it's going to burst, just like the real estate market, just like dot mm -hmm. bomb, all right, yeah. things are going to burst, because people are like putting way too much more into it than it really is, mm -hmm. I think yeah, it's going to be easy, and then after, you know, no, thousands of companies fail because they don't know how to run a freaking business after the products get started. Um, we're going to see a lot of saturation. When people are going to get screwed sooner or later. They're going to yeah. pledge and they say, oh, this is a shitty product. This is a shitty game. Or I never even got my stuff because these guys couldn't get enough money going to production because they overshot their you know, budget. Their yeah. Budget. yeah. Catherine Locke says it means the startups have to get smarter and sell their ideas better. Well, yeah, but you know that's basic business sense. It doesn't just happen at Kickstarter. It happens if you just start a brick and mortar store. That starts if you. It also happens if you start an online store. If you want to sell on Amazon or eBay or, or have your own website. Yeah, that's just basic business. You know, you have an idea, you have a product, you have to know how to sell it. You know how to. You got to know how to produce it and keep it going and stuff like that. You know, a lot of people have a lot of ideas, but it doesn't mean that's always going to work. Yeah. Um. Like another thing is like with the painters in this is that was one thing I touched on earlier. With all the Kickstarters out there, 
is it going to affect the hobbies as much as the gamers? Because a lot of the hobbyists they don't they don't invest in full sets. They don't invest in giant armies. They invest in their models that they feel like they want to paint. Well, yeah, it will affect it because it's still they're still they're still selling the product. Now look at companies like Chapter House and uh, Cyber and all of these other companies in the, in Europe that just produces miniatures. Um, I mean, look at Les who produce Will and all of it. There's no game system behind it. We just produce figures that uh, we hope people would like and paint up. Um, so it's still selling a product. If you kickstart a miniature line, and then when you go into production and you're ready to ship it out, it comes out like crap. You're never going to buy from you ever again. It doesn't matter how much kickstarting you do, they'll remember the company. You say, wow, XYZ widget company produced the worst freaking miniature I ever kickstarted. Right. I'm never ever going to buy from them. And they go and kickstart you know, a new, new figure, no one's going to buy them. Yeah. Angelic One says, Kickstarter was not actually establ established to fund new companies. It was created to fund new ideas and new projects. We use Kickstarter to expand our base products and give the gamer more bang for their initial investment. That's true. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's a trend now. Yeah. But, you know, like, like the Internet, the Internet will evolve. This whole Kickstarting fad will evolve into something either bigger or smaller or a bomb. Okay, or it might bomb and then become something completely different. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of good, like, thought, but, okay, I don't know if you guys remember the dot com era where every investor was investing in every single idea. Uh, what was that stupid pet? It was a stupid pet thing uh, website that was one of those big ideas that was supposed to make millions and millions of dollars. Everyone invested into it. It failed, it bombed. And this happened to all these other, you know, new, new dot, dot com start uh, web businesses. Um, so what happened was it saturated the market, everything collapsed, and that's why it's called stuff up, right? And then, and then you have stuff like MySpace. Remember when MySpace, everyone had a MySpace? They're like, yeah. you got to get a MySpace, you got to get a MySpace. Yeah. I told someone, said, hey, remember MySpace? You know, you should have been on it. You're, you're a young kid. I'm like, what the hell is MySpace? <laughs> uh, you don't know what MySpace is? No, I use Facebook, you know, and stuff like that. Because you just came into the era of... of MySpace failing because Facebook came over and took over with a better idea, right. more innovative idea. Right. Yeah, I think MySpace is still around. I think you know they're doing it something. Is. I they advertise on TV. Better, I'm like, I don't give a yeah. shit. Yeah. You know, I'm like, you guys are like old school. Like, keep up with the freaking Joneses here. And that's the other thing yeah. too. That's the thing about running business. You have to, you have to be able to adapt. Yeah. Uh, because the market changes a lot in any industry, right? And I know that well because. Every day, I might get a phone call and say, from my boss saying, oh, shit, this just happened in Europe. What the hell are we going to do? You know, and stuff like that. So you have to be able to adapt to the market. And a lot of people can't do that. That's why a lot of local LFG fail. Because yeah. they're always, they're on the old school mindset of, oh, they'll walk in and buy my stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? Get the hell on the internet. Sell your shit. Sell your wares. I mean, that's where it's in now. Everyone's buying on the internet. Mm -hmm. okay, if you're still stuck in this old school mentality, then you might just save your money now, you know, get what you can out of it, and just close your damn shop. So you can't keep up. You know. But um, yeah, Kickstarter is going to change. It's going to evolve. It's going to de-evolve or whatever, and then, or some some new crowdfunding type of idea is going to come out and it's going to blow Kickstarter out of the water, and no one's going to use Kickstarter anymore because this whole new idea came up. Well, no one knew what the hell crowdfunding was. What a year ago, right? Yeah, like it was just one of these things. Like you heard once, like oh, I, I, someone's on Kickstarter. What's that? And then slowly, as it one thing got successful from Kickstarter, it got publicity, it got news. Then it's it started that snowball effect now to where yeah. more and more people are going to latch on to it until, right. like you said, eventually it's going to crash. I'm sorry, uh, kind of says MySpace is for brands these days. Um, if I had a brand, I would never do it on MySpace. This is always, I do it on G Plus or, or Facebook because that's yeah. Up I can't remember the last time I even heard the term MySpace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other than in jokes, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, hey, exactly. ever heard of MySpace? No, <laughs> exactly. You know, all the 15 year olds <laughs> are going, my what, huh? Yeah, exactly. Um, They're advertising on TV example. now. 
Yeah. Yeah. Here's a little good example uh, about oversaturation uh, uh, as, as a Kickstarter. And this is a very good example. And I think only D D people will understand this. Um, 10, 11 years ago, Wizard came out with this thing they think they, they thought they came up with this awesome idea about open source gaming. Let's call it D20. We're going to jump into this. So they said, look, we're not going to sue you. You have to do. We're not going to sue you if you use our name or whatever, as long as twenty percent of it is always credited to you know uh, our company. Came out the open source gaming. Came out D twenty D twenty system. So all these companies came out with these new game, these these adventure models or whatever, and they were done through the garage in the garage in someone's garage. The garage kids doing the shit. Okay, what happened? Oversaturated the market. Right? No one's buying anything because no one knows what they're going to get. Just because you can come up with a model doesn't mean you're going to write it well. All right? They're like, oh, I have this idea for a model. I'll write it. You're not a freaking writer. Right? So you release these e-books and you're reading through it. Going, I can't read this. Is this English? It says English. But I can't understand it because these, these guys don't have an editor. You guys didn't go through the creative editing process or what have you. So they really shit. So what happened? The market got saturated. No one gave a shit. People are like, oh yeah, you know, buy an ebook model. I'm like, no, I have no clue who um, Johnny B. Good is. Who the fuck is that? Oh, he makes models out of his garage in Minnesota, in his mother's basement, whatever. I'm like, I'm not gonna buy that. Because I don't want to spend five dollars on a model I can't read or use. Okay, so that's a good example of oversaturating the market when you open it up that big. And uh, yeah. yeah. But anyways, that could happen with Kickstarters where every garage kid is making some kind of product thinking that it's a good idea. And then when they try to sell it to people, they drop the ball. That's the thing. Yeah. It's just like like you said, the evolution of the internet the way it is now. is Eventually, someone's going to move off from Kickstarter and it's going to start a new boom. And everybody's going to jump on that. And then eventually that's going to change. And it's just going to keep moving from one thing to another. Yeah. yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people, I think people can go that way. Unless people really start being smart about it. You know, either way, whether Kickstarter is around or not, crowdfunding is around. You know? So if you wanted to start a company and Kickstarter is not around you anymore, uh, and you go go went out of business or whatever, you can crowdfund your own stuff. You just It's going to be harder to market. You can just create a website and say donate uh, ahead of time, and then we'll, we'll make this product for you. It's not even a, a new idea or anything. It's just an organized uh, old idea. Yeah. Pay me to make your product, and then I'll right. pay if you think it's a good idea. It, it's the same thing. It's just like service. You know, you don't get your service until you pay for it. Or at least most people should be charging ahead of time for services before you actually do something. Yeah. So it's kind of like that. You're paying ahead of time for the product. Yeah. Here's one thing, and I mean this this question just came to my mind is, are the companies like GW, like Privateer Press, if if Kickstarter does have that implosion, are they the ones that's going to reap the benefits of it more because they're already established, and people are going to go to the traditional game systems that they know are legitimate, like that's what oh, I was thinking. That's oh, I sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, like oh, I. Um, miniature game X just bit me, in, bit me in the ass. Mm -hmm. What the, I know, War Machine's been around or Warhammer's been around for a while. Let me go and try that. Right, they've gained the people's trust. That's true. They have a market. They have established market. Yeah. And I, I think that's the thing. I mean, you got to look at it. Is sooner or later, it's going to be Kickstarter, Kickstarter publishers out there. Okay, I think that's the next step where these companies are so successful about running Kickstarters that the guy that has this idea saying, well, I don't want to kickstart a Kickstarter on my own. I don't know really how to do it. It's my first time. And then the, the publisher will come in and say, hey, well, why don't you give us 60% of your profits on this Kickstarter and we'll kickstart it for you under our company's brand. Yeah. Okay? That's going to happen soon. Yeah, right. I don't probably. know if it's happening now, but it will happen soon. It's the same thing that happens on YouTube. You get those stupid emails about joining a network or whatever. Half of them don't really work. Half of them just want to, you know, you know, just look big and squeeze, you know, whatever they can out of your channel type of thing. Um, 
but it, I think it will happen because it, it's just the way that the market works. You're gonna have to have a publisher that knows what they're doing to get, you know, anything successful. Out. You got and you gotta look at it that way. You know, um, because a lot of people might, you know, don't start Kickstarters, no fail, they're gonna like fail. It's just pretty much like anything. You start putting more stuff, and the first year is what's gonna dictate whether you make it or not. It's gonna be that statistics too with with I think Kickstarters as well. <coughs> and here's another thing to actually look at for like the the evolution of Kickstarter. We mentioned like going to publishers, like maybe GW Publishing. What about as like we have we have YouTube followers now. We have people on forums. Like what if like okay, I'm making a miniature and I went up to you or or let's say, hey, would you guys endorse my game as? I'll give you these models to paint and you can put your seal of approval on it. Do you think that'll also be a, a way that Kickstarter is going to start going? Like, oh, it's already doing. It's already doing that. It's, it's been happening. Kickstarting people will send up products that, like prototype products uh, for us YouTubers to review just to gain interest in the Kickstarter itself. Um, I know that uh, like War, Warzone sent me stuff to review for the Kickstarter. Unfortunately, sent me like towards the end of the Kickstarter. I'm like, dude, this is a little late. You know, yeah, it's sending you ahead of time. Um, but people do that. Um, like uh, that lighting system. Power play. Uh, they were sending out all their lighting systems everywhere. You know, little sample packets to YouTubers and, and uh, anyone that could get the word out about the Kickstarter. Mm. And then, uh, you know, people use it and then they show it off and say, hey, look at this great thing that these people are doing. We're doing the Kickstarter. Okay. And, and you look at it because there, there lies in where you're running back into the whole cycle of where you have to spend money to make money, you know, mm -hmm. to get yeah. the word out on your Kickstarter, which is really easy in a hobby, I think, is if you create something that's going to make you cream in your pants, people will talk about it. Yeah. If you make something that's like, ooh, why, why would I buy this? No one's going to buy into it. They're not going to Kickstarter into it. Mm -hmm. right? And this is why I'm saying, oh, sooner or later there's going to be Kickstarter publishers out there where you go to them and say, I have this idea for a game, um, and I'll give you 50% of my profit if you guys pimp it out. And the publisher look at it and go, well, is this worth my time? Is it a good idea? Is it worth the X amount of profit I'm going to get out of it? And they're going to say, sure, we'll kickstart it. And they kickstart it under their name. So again, I have to go back to Simon because I think Simon really, really hit the mark here where they they have such a good name right now. I mean. I've been watching Sima for a long time and before they were publishing games. And now they're publishing games. I look at it, I go, well, if I ever need a published game, if I had a good idea and I'm really serious about it, I would probably go to Sima and, and see if I could get an interest from them uh, in buying my game because it's worth the profits that you know both of us are going to make for them to you know pimp it out if I want a su successful game rather than going alone and trying to do it for Kickstarter. Now, you know, there's a lot of variables in it because you got to look at some of the weird Kickstarters that are out there. Um, and I'm not speaking bad just because I'm going to talk about uh, mini war gaming. Is that they put out a Kickstarter and say, we need this amount of money. We need, what was it, five grand to get new yeah. equipment? And they made 200 and something grand. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> I quit. Okay. Uh, that was retarded nuts. And, you know, you have those aberrations in business as, it is, as you will have in Kickstarter. Sometimes you look at it and go, I want to buy new underwear, please fund it. And then suddenly they make a million dollars <laughs> yeah. and it's like, yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. So, but it's they, they deserve it, though. They, they deserve <laughs> it. They really do earn their fans. Well, yeah, their they fans. deserve it. And they also have already established base. Yes. You yeah. know? And sometimes you look at some of the Kickstarters out that, have, that doesn't have an established, established base, yeah. and I'm a little scared about that. They'll yep. do this whole Kickstarter and fail at it, and the people are going to go, oh, I'm never going to trust Kickstarting again, and then it ruins for everyone else. Absolutely. Same thing with commission painting. Um, a lot of garage people that uh, you know, I wouldn't say garage people. I'd say you know um, the one man show versus blue table painters, and, and even in that sense, yeah, it can go bad too. Is that the all these you know single solo uh, commission artists uh, don't know how to you know get themselves out there or understand the basic business principles about you know when someone pays for something, get it to them. And get it in good quality, because mm -hmm. if you don't, if the, if the new guy comes in the hobby and say, and talks to a friend and say, I can't pay all this, he goes, why don't you hire a commission service to do it? 
They go, oh, where do I find it? He goes, well, you can get these, you know, guys that do it, you know, by themselves for a pretty, you know, cheap price. You know, they're not Golden Demon Award winners or anything. Every time you get a Golden Demon Award, you get to tack on 20 bucks to your price. Okay? So, like, less, you won, what, two, three? So, that's why he's so expensive. Because he's got the Demon, Golden Demon Awards behind him. But let's just say you just go go to someone that doesn't have that stuff and say, oh, yeah, I'll paint your figure for 10 bucks, you know, for the whole army. Like, oh, great. And then the guy, like, realizes, oh, my God, he just sent me 20,000, no, 2,000 points of Skaven, and I just charged 20 bucks per unit. And then, and then they're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to, you know, whatever. I'm not going to do this. I'm never going to send to it. I'm never going to talk to him again, you know, and stuff like that. And then suddenly people are not going to trust the commission painters anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's true. So that's, that's uh, you know, one thing that they have to watch out for people. So they could run into that whole thing. You know, when trust kicks on anymore. Yeah, and I think as, like as we were talking, as that slow decline happens, that's what's going to happen. That's what it's going to lead to. It is right now you have a bad Kickstarter here, a bad Kickstarter here, but it's always overshadowed by the hundreds of good Kickstarters out there. Yeah. But slowly, that's going to start tilting the other way, where it's going to be more bad experience than good experiences. Or the bad experience, it, it might be more good experiences, but the the bad experience that can get more vocal. Yeah. Or like, or a company may, someone might go to the media and say like, oh, I got ripped off this way. And it's just going to start getting bl- bad publicity as someone who may not know what Kickstarter is or just getting into it. They're going to want, they're going to see this and they're going to be wary of it. I mean, I think eBay had that problem for a while. Where you start having like a lot of people were getting these bad experiences from eBay, and people were getting wary of. Yeah. Schnauzer face said, "I'm going to do a Kickstarter to hire someone to organize Chung's painting room." <laughs> dude, that's got to be a big Kickstarter, dude. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure what kind of is saying that's happening to me or not right now. It's already happening. Yeah, but um, no, you know what? Every time I clean this, don't even give me that shit about organizing my shit. I cleaned the crap out of this desk one day, and then the next day it was all like this again. And I started yeah. painting, so it's just it's worthless. It's, there's no point. It's like making hey. your bed. It's pointless, right? It's, yeah, it's it better is. than it's better than living in the terrorist bunker down here, man. With all By the way, someone said cords. that it looks your background makes it look like you're building a robot. Yeah, that was awesome paint job. Little at bits of Wally and Johnny Five behind yeah, you. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, Kickstarter is going to evolve. They're going to, you know, run into problems, uh, like always. It's going to trend and it's going to untrend, uh, but yeah. that's just the nature of it. You know, at, at the end, like I told people, everything is going to go back. It's a cycle. Everything, you know, you can put out all these cool, uh, you know, new techniques of, uh, you know, kickstarting a business or what have you. Um, but at the end, it's all about the community. It's about the people who are putting money in, you know, pull, pulling money out of the wallet and put it into your bank account. It's about them. And a lot of people seem to forget that. You know, it's just going to cycle back to, oh, we got to, we gotta talk to the community. We gotta, you know, we gotta, uh, we gotta establish uh, a rapport with the people who are buying our stuff. Okay, because just like the internet, it's a cycle. Back in the heydays, before the internet, I was on, I was running and helping running uh, PBSs. I don't know if anyone knows what PBS. Is. You dial up and you get into this bullet board system. Everything's oh PBS, yeah, man. PBS, yeah. right? Yeah. And that was the event of all like me. That was sure was a huge thing. Prodigy, CopyServe, before then, right? Before, right when they were popping up, we had our PPL. and mm-hmm. uh, you know the newspapers back then. When you know newspapers, it, they it was words printed on a, a, you know like a stack of papers. <laughs> I, I know I just have to you know, clarify that um, they would come and do stories about our BBS and stuff because that was a new in thing. And the thing that everything stressed about was it was community. You know, because of my bulletin board system, I could at two AM I could do a system broadcast and say, Denny's meet, let's go. Right? So everyone will pile up in the car and go to Denny's and there'll be like fifty people at Denny's, 
you know, freaking out, you know, the waitresses because they're like, wow, where did all these people come from at 2 a.m. in the morning? You know? <laughs> but it was all about community. Then the internet came. All right. Um, had this heyday. At, at its very infancy back then, the internet wasn't like the internet now. There was like only the elites of the elites went on the internet. And usually to hack in, you know, yeah. government sites or whatever, right? Now that's when you're putting your headset. Back then, phones had headsets and they had cords on it, right? <laughs> so you put this headset really? on this little, little cradle that listened to the tone to your your um, uh, your phone. So that's how you hooked up to the internet back then. Um, but um, yeah, then the internet blew up and then it killed the BBS. Yeah. Right. Okay. It was all about websites. It was all about websites. Then something something weird happened. They're like, oh wow, we can connect to our customers with you, our community. So they created forums and stuff like that. Uh, forums, which you still, still see nowadays, is still the same you know type of structure. So then that happened. Then suddenly you know they kind of veered away from it because everything became um, the dot bomb, uh, MySpace back when it was popular. Yeah. And uh, and they're like, oh yeah, it's all about you know getting the word out, getting the word out, all about advertising. The whole totally lost aspect of being able to communicate with the customers. So they ignore stuff like chat. They ignore stuff like the forum. They only use forums for support and stuff, right? And then suddenly this new thing came out called Facebook. And they're like, wow, we can connect to our community because that's what it's about. So everything's all about community again and, and stuff like that. So you have that whole cycle where it always comes back down to the people. You know, yeah. I mean, that, that the whole foundation of it is all about people. So no matter how much you can kickstart a good idea or whatever, you still have to have that whole mentality of, these people were giving me money. I gotta be nice to them. So let's show them what we can give them. No type of thing. Yeah. So, anyways, I think that's it. Yeah, I think we're good because yeah. we got really uncomfortably silent. Because <laughs> 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 I was like, "Oh, what do I say now?" I don't know. Awkward. <laughs> yeah, and I go to chat Just when everyone's talking show. about something else now. <laughs> I know. Uh, you, were on, just, you were on a roll, man. Uh, yeah, man. <laughs> when you're passionate, uh, you're passionate. Whew. I just love to, it. I love it. To break the bubble for kind of face right now. He's, I think he's arguing with Angelica. Come on, you're talking to the, the marketing director of Simon right now, dude. So just let you know. If you're trying to argue with him about what Simon's doing, then I, I think you kind of have the inside scoop about what Simon's doing. <laughs> Well, anyways, guys, uh, we'll just call it good for right now because we went way overboard. I think we're almost over two hours now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's not make this a habit, I guess. I don't know. But it, it was a really good episode. I think we, we found out a lot of good topics. Did you get your purging out? All your purging? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not purging. No. Because I think Dave's still trying to purge my cow into chaos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he's, he's not going to let up on that. Uh, but anyways, uh, Thank you for watching this week. Um, this is Chung. Check out the WG Consortium uh, website, wgconsortium.com website to get uh, to talk in our forums and stuff and all these cool, nifty things that isn't out yet. But anyways, uh, maybe you want to say, uh, do your little conclusion. All right, guys, just check out my YouTube channel, Hobby Hot Tips, if you haven't already. And also, the first place winner of my contest still has not contacted me. So you have five days left. Please, please. Private message me so I don't give away your prize to somebody else. Patrick uh, McCarty. Advice on, um, usually, like, I don't know, 80% of the time they don't claim the prize. I don't know why. So Aww. And it's weird. It's like, oh, I want free stuff, and they enter and they win. They don't ever claim it. That's all right. I'll Aww, just, I'll just private that. message you my address. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, James? Done. Yeah, uh, just go ahead and check out my YouTube channel, Gift to Chaos Studio. Um, follow along. I'm doing uh, some update stuff for Fritz. I'm painting some uh, third edition um, Space Hulk stuff right now and uh, doing some Tyranid commissions. So follow along, guys. Right on. Yes? Uh, yep. Uh, YouTube.com slash The Mystics. You can always go on there and watch my shenanigans with Mario. As we we are doing a show on there called Sunshine and Moonbeam, Journey to Crystal Brush 2014. Oh, and there you go, guys. Sorry, I was reading chat. I totally didn't hear you. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thanks again, guys. Uh, see you guys next week. Me and Minnie Girl will see you guys next week, and we'll figure out what we're going to talk about then.
Well, anyways, guys. Yeah, yeah. I'm, well, we'll I may you. not. I may not next week because I I'm going out of town for the holiday weekend. Okay. Wait, what holiday? I was for the Fourth of July. <laughs> Fourth of July. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's Wednesday, Chung. <laughs> I don't pay attention to the holiday. Well, just let me know. <laughs> We always, uh, I'll, I'll get up early. I was going to let you know, but actually we just made the decision this morning. So. All right. That's cool. Sounds good. All right, guys. We will see you next week and uh, over and out. And I'm going to click end broadcast.